morning, everybody. It's great to be back in Antwerp. We have been really, really looking forward to, um, to this conference and to NAPTEC days. Um, we have really a lot of things to show you, so you should look forward to a great conference. Lucas line up, great sessions. We have a lot of people from Microsoft, a lot of experts. We're going to share your knowledge and show all the cool stuff we have um, put in Business Central. But uh, before we, um, we dig into it, uh, I'd like to leave the floor to Thomas. Thomas? Thank you. So being here today is, again, fantastic. And thank you, Luke, for, for having us once more. And we're here to talk about Business Central. And we are in such a great place with that. I mean, the enthusiasm and everything here, I've, I'm so proud of the things we've we gone here. But having, you know, beginning of a new era, we are also saying goodbye to something. And in this case, we are saying goodbye, as Luke was saying, the NAV tech days, the NAV name. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to NAV as such. Uh, but I also have another announcement that we're going to say goodbye to me. Uh, this will be the last time I'm at, at Tech Day since I'm resigning from Microsoft, and this will actually be my last official duty, and last workday will be Tuesday next week. So I was thinking about how, how, do, you, uh, how do you do a goodbye? I've uh, been here since the beginning, and, and what is a better way of looking back to what we have achieved and what look at the product throughout all the years. And this is from the first Tech Days in 2011, where Michael and I did the history of NAV. You see the good old blue screens there. We talked about the new architecture uh, and the client vision of you know, uh, different clients and so forth. And these clients, uh, they were very visionary. You know, look at this. They got the app lineup on the Windows phone absolutely correct. Um, we talked about debugger demo, and that was the year where we introduced the query object. But we also start talking about Azure, talking about the cloud, uh, which was the first year that was out in, in 2011. And some of the statements on those slides still holds, right? How do we reduce the cards? How do we reduce? How do we get into the? We all into the cloud and so forth. Everything is more or less uh, the same today. Cloud is going to be the, the future. So in 2012, we talked about some of the topics listed here, but the most important thing were forms were out, uh, pages were in, and the classic were kind of removed at that point at, at runtime. Had a lot of other things appearing at that point. Again, debugger query and client improvements and, and what have we. 2013 was, was an interesting year. 2013, we released the SharePoint client. Um, and don't ever ask us why we did SharePoint Client before Web Client, but we released SharePoint Client 2013. Other things were multi-tenancy that, that came along in 2013. Um, we had very packed agenda that year, talking about you know, upgrade code, reporting, word reporting, uh, and of course the help server, each you know, being very big areas uh, into the product that particular year. And then we started to loosen up. Uh, Michael and I did this Mythbuster thing. I don't know for the guys that's been here who can recall we, we did that. We had these slides of a, uh, a claim and whether it was true or not, and the most favorite one was this one. Uh, I don't know, really know why, but uh, it just occurred to me that looking at the long version there that today I'm the same age that Michael were when he stopped, which is kind of interesting. Uh, anyways, so moving on, after 2013 came 2014. We talked about these things, and I think the, the thing I definitely want to talk about from 2014 is the web and tablet client uh, that came out that year. Uh, fantastic product, fantastic involvement for, for the product itself. And then the lab was introduced that year, and this one particularly was interesting because this is the early drawing on the whiteboard in my office at that point of the how extensions were later to come around. So this is kind of like the raw material, so to speak, which was presented first in, in 2014. 2015 tech days were a little bit sad. That was the year where we said goodbye to Michael. Um, this is a picture posted by, by Gary uh, on Facebook, actually, uh, where he caught both of us in 2015. And there's actually some sound there that I often use um, a little bit confused, you know, and is this really Michael? And here you can go. Thomas, you screwed up my demo. <laughs> yes, that's, I need to hear that again, absolutely. Thomas, you screwed up my demo. <laughs> that, is, that is Michael for sure. Um, you see, Gary called us the dream twins. So when Michael left, I had to find a new twin. And you know what? I got assigned this guy. <laughs> you know, 
The weapon is self-frightening. The more frightening thing are the earmufflers, right? Very hard to talk to this guy. And he speaks French. That's even worse. <laughs> Anyways. No, Vince and I had an absolute great time. We started in 2015 with a lineup of new things. Finally, we got the upgrade, uh, the editor to Notepad, as I said often, got the new editor at that point. And one thing I want to absolutely highlight here is, of course, the managed service and our start to venture into the cloud. The, the entire how to manage a service, how to deploy into the cloud, all the issues we had to take care of. It's been phenomenal work. Uh, by the team to do that with, with the product, which is also the reason we stand here today. Other things from 2015 <coughs> was, of course, the extensions and the events that was presented and used in the product at, at that point. Again, huge uh, things done into the to product moving where we are today. 2016 was again about <coughs> cloud, uh, but again, about a lot of things that are where we are today. We started a little bit talking about machine learning. And finally, in 2017, we kind of completed a lot of the cloud talk at that point. And if I were to highlight something from, from that area, it would definitely be the modern development, which is now in full floor, and there'll be a lot of talk about that uh, later today, obviously. Uh, but also the new UX, or the new user interface, is so beautiful, uh, what we have today, and that was started there as well. And obviously, we talked about machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is also going to be a very important part of, of the product moving forward. Now, looking at that list uh, and looking back at my 15 years with Microsoft, I'm, kinda, I'm so proud of this product. I mean, I want to say thank you to both Vincent, the guys and the team, Luke, for having this conference, people at Microsoft, and definitely all of you guys that, that makes all this possible. Thank you. Now, <laughs> thanks a lot, folks. So I do have one thing um, to, to mention. I was called Directions, where Klaus Lundström, as one among many, you know, asked me about. Uh, there's something on my bio he was a little bit curious about. First of all, do you read these bios? I don't. And I went to the Mibusa site and actually found my own one. And at starter, it says 12 years with Microsoft. So it's three years since I've been updating that one. Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of a little bit embarrassing. And then at the bottom, there's something there that I was asked about by many of you. What is this pilot thing? Uh, what, what is that? And uh, I might as well clean the house since uh, before I go. And look at this. Isn't that nice? You know, that's every mother-in-law's dream, you know. And the picture to the right actually describes an era where A, I was a smoker, and B, you were allowed to smoke in the cockpit. That's actually interesting. Um, what happened was that the passengers got banned from smoking, and then pilots were still allowed to do it. But there was this always somebody complaining on row 17 where the air fan recirculation and so forth. Well, not a good idea. But the reason I'm sharing this is also because I still do that. So this is from the last time I renewed my certificate. And even though I quit this job, and that's the last time I quit a job, it was 15 years before I started at Microsoft, I'm still you know, tagging along uh, and renewing my certificate. And you know, folks, I'm going to renew my Business Central certificate for the upcoming year. You know, we don't know. So thanks a lot for having, having me. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'll leave the states to Vincent, who, by the way, he brought in three people to replace me. I find that absolutely natural. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Thomas. There you go, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you, Thomas. Good luck, team, with your new adventure and, and endeavors. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So, as Thomas said, it has been really um, a fantastic journey with um, uh, this product. It started as um, as in a vision and um, became Dynamics NAV when Microsoft acquired it. Now it's called Business Central. And it's 30, 31 years of heritage, uh, 2, uh, 220,000 customers, and, and we reach more than 3 million users all over the world. And more than th the product is sold in more than 200 countries. And that wouldn't be possible without, without you guys. We have you know, a partner community, IQ, a developer community like yours is really something that our competition is envying us. We have more than 4,500 4, partners all over the world supporting us. And that's really fantastic and, and really a big thank you for that. Business Central 
is still evolving a lot. In the last six months alone, we introduced more than 100 improvements to the product. Um, you see them scrolling on the screen right now. Obviously, it wouldn't be possible to uh, go in, in details of all each of one of them in this keynote, but uh, you know, at tender sessions, you'll see there's a lot of cool stuff in there. So it's, it's a product which is, have been really evolving constantly. We keep, you know, we keep putting new stuff in it, we keep changing it, keep, keep improving it, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's going to continue for, for many years to come. Business Central is everywhere. This spring, uh, we released Business Central in the cloud and Dynamics NAV 2018 on-prem. This fall, we release Business Central everywhere, both in the cloud and on-prem. One product, one name, you know, we're moving all the confusion around, around the naming. And you know, as, as Luke mentioned before, now we only have Business Central, so maybe next year is gonna be BC Tech Days. You know, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, anyway, no matter the name, I'm sure there will be many tech days to come because we have a lot of work to do still. We have a lot of work ahead of us, um, but I'll get back to that. So when we, um, at Microsoft, when, when we uh, think about Business Central, we, we have um, a philosophy around the product. We have some things we you know, tend to associate the product with and rally everybody around. Um, and you, you know, Business Central is a, is a very rich product. It has a lot of functionality, you know, financial management, um, you know, supply chain management. And recently, with, with the data we have and the introduction and machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, we've brought Business Central to a, a world-class ERP system. So not only is it rich in, um, in functionality, but it's also part of a very rich ecosystem. It integrates with Office, uh, Power BI, Flow, the Power Apps. So it's really you know, a, a part of the, of the big Microsoft family. So the keywords we, uh, we uh, always uh, have around um, Business Central, the things that we are railing uh, us around are modern, unified, intelligent, and adaptable. I'll get, so the modern part, uh, I'll get back to that. We, it's going, you see it's going to be a theme for this keynote. We're going to talk a lot about the, the modern part of it. Unify, unify obviously, because it's, a, uh, it's part of, of this uh, very large ecosystem. Intelligent, with the introduction of machine learning. And adaptable, because as I'm sure you know, it's a fully customizable product. And, and thanks to you guys, um, we ship Business Central and you can add the, the, you know, you can take it to the last mile and add the real value that makes it a great product for, for your customers. So, modern, I said I'll get back to modern. Um, how many of you are familiar with Seaside? Most of you are familiar with Seaside, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, when you look at Seaside, uh, modern is not exactly the word that comes to mind, right? So, so uh, we, we need to do something about that to be uh, true to the, you know, this modern philosophy. Um, so for about roughly one and a half year ago, we started this journey and we, uh, we, uh, we started working on what we call the modern development environment. And you, you know, Thomas talked about it, we talked about it already. Um, and this is, this is you know, obviously something that was needed and Visual Studio Code is, of course, the best and a great platform for, uh, for uh, hosting or, or development environment. So how many of you are familiar with Visual Studio Code and are already using it? Yeah, quite a few people, yeah. Uh, actually, you can, you can see the hands when uh, <laughs> you, you can clap, but you can also, I can see you guys. Okay, so if you're not, um, if you're not, if, if you haven't started using Visual Studio Code, I, you know, I really recommend you, you, you try it out and you start using it and start you know, considering moving your solution to Visual Studio Code. I'll do a quick recap uh, to show you how, how easy it is to get started. So you go to the, uh, to the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio Code download page, just search for it in your um, search engine of choice. And uh, download, um, you download it and install it. It's a free product. Uh, it takes literally a few minutes. And uh, we have, so you see there's three versions here. 
the Windows version is of course the one that, that where everything works, but actually the Mac version uh, is also, we also support Mac partially. We can, uh, there's a few scenarios that, that are not supported, but you, should you, you know, should you want to, de to develop on your Mac, that's also possible. And um, once you've installed it, it takes less than two minutes. Um, you go on the extension page, uh, on the extension tab, and look for AL. And um, the extension is e easily recognizable with a Business Central logo. You install that extension, and that's it. You, you're up and running. Um, so I'll quickly show you how, how that looks. Um, let me get my computer started here. So you have Visual Studio Code here. And uh, all you need to do is Alt A, Alt L, like AL, which is the language um, we're using for, for customizing Business Central. Choose a, you choose a project folder here. And the Visual Studio uh, creates a template of an extension for you. Um, you see here I can choose between a cloud sandbox or, or on my local server. So you can use Visual Studio Code to develop in the cloud or locally. I'll uh, go and choose the cloud sandbox. And that's it. I have um, you know, everything I need to start, um, to start debugging and uh, to start coding. So you'll notice here the squiggly, the red squiggly lines here. So what's happening here is that when I first start Visual Studio uh, Code, I it's going to connect to my tenant and uh, figure out uh, the symbols I'll be using and download the symbols. Uh, so just bef and it takes a little while uh, on the network the first time you do that. And uh, that's why my customer list, he didn't know that I had a customer list, but after he downloaded the symbol from my tenant, uh, it recognized the customer list as an existing page, and then the, the squiggle disappeared. You can see in the output window that it says that the symbols have been downloaded. So at all time, you'll be, you'll, your environment will be in sync with, uh, with the tenant on which you are, you are you're coding for. Um, so when we... Um, when we um, when you develop and you extend Business Central, we have been uh, recommending uh, the usage of event as the uh, preferred mechanism of extensibility. And the reason it's simple is that events is the good mechanism to save you trouble, uh, especially during upgrade. Um, so it's a, it's a loose carbon mechanism, a strong, strong extensibility mechanism, um, and there's less chance that you, or less risk you'll, uh, you'll be broken when, when we upgrade from one version to the other. And to make the product truly really, uh, customizable, we have been adding a lot of events, a lot of, um, a lot of integration points into Business Central. Um, during the last year, I think we added about 2,700 uh, events, which is really a lot of events, but to really make the, the product fully customizable. So we got some feedback. You, got, you gave us the feedback that it's, it's hard to figure out which event uh, needs to be uh, uh, you subscribed to in order to, to, customize, uh, to customize Business Central. So we, we have listened to, uh, to your feedback, and um, I'll show you how we can, um, how we can get some help uh, in figuring out which, uh, which event you, you, need to, uh, you need to subscribe to. So let's, let's imagine I, I, um, I want to write an extension that does something when, uh, just for the sake of the demonstration here, that does something when the email uh, of a customer is edited on the customer card. It could be I want to validate the email, for example, or you know, check, check with a web service that it exists, something like that, uh, or send an email through some, some, uh, some web service. Um, so I want to listen to, uh, I want my extension to be called when, when I, modify, um, I modify the email of the customer on the customer page. So what I've done here, I've started, uh, I've logged on my tenant, uh, show the customer page, and have duplicate, uh, I've duplicated the, this tab just to make sure I'm in, in the same session. You don't necessarily have to do that, but I just find it's a practical way to do it. And in the tab, in the second tab, I'm going to look for, for the event recorder page. And it does, so what, what, does, what this event recorder does is exla exactly what you think it does. When I start it, it's going to record all the events that are triggered by Business Central. So the idea here is I start the event recorder, run the scenario I want to extend, or uh, the scenario I want uh, to figure out which event are triggered uh, within. I stop the event recorder and look at the event. So let me show you. I go here and start. I said, yes, I want to start the event recording. I go to this page, run my scenario. In that case, uh, just you know, 
change something uh, in the email, just edit the email. Go back to the event recorder page, stop it. You see that's recording 17, 17 events uh, while I was doing that, uh, that operation uh, in Business Central. So here it is. Here are all the events that get triggered um, while I did what I just did on the customer page. So in my scenario, I want to do something when, when the email is edited. And when I look at event number 13 here, it says on, validate, on after validate events on the email elements. So that sounds like a good uh, integration point. That's, that seems to be the place where I want to, uh, to insert my code. So if you scroll on the right here, there is um, there's a column that says get AL snippet. And if you click on it, uh, we actually provide you with a, with a uh, code snippet you can use directly in Visual Studio Code to, to subscribe to, to the event. So the tricky part is, is to figure out you know, what uh, the event declaration is, and we, we actually do the work for you here. So I'm just going to go on and uh, copy that. Then I go to my Visual Studio Code. I have, have prepared a small extension um, so you don't uh, need to see me typing. So uh, it's a very simple extension. It just has one code, one code unit with one procedure that shows a message uh, saying that the email has been changed. And uh, just in, you know, before the procedure, I just paste the, the event subscriber declaration I copied from, uh, from the event recorder. And that's it. That's all, that's all I need to do. So now I'm going to launch my extension using Control F5. So Control F5 builds, uh, package my extension deploys it to, uh, to my tenant, and uh, in a couple of seconds, it should launch the, the customer page where everything works, if the demo gods are with me. There you go. Uh, let me log on here. Now everybody's going to know my password. So I'm on the customer page here. My extension should be deployed. I'll just go and edit, um, edit the email again. And here we go, my, the, the message got, uh, got shown, so my extension got called. So that's it. That's how easy it is to, um, to get started with, with developing and, and customizing Business Central. Um, so when we, um, when we modernize the development environment, um, we wouldn't be true to the modernization if we didn't do something about the base app as well, because when you develop and customize Business Central, you work on top of the base app. So we've done a lot of work, and we have a lot of work also in, uh, in progress, which is about modernizing the base app. But for that, I would like to invite Bogsy on stage, who is going to tell us about modernizing the base app. Bogsy. Thank you, Vincent. And uh, I must admit, uh, the new modern development environment looks absolutely fantastic. Um, and you know, considering that I was actually part of the team that built the original version of Seaside, you know, I kind of feel that it, it's a good replacement when, when we can finally sunset Seaside. It's a little bit sad, but um, you know, it actually needs to, to happen. Absolutely right. Um, in addition to modernizing the um, development environment, we also want to modernize the actual application code. If we look at the current state of the code, um, it is actually an application that has evolved over the last 25 years or more. There's actually code in there that's you know, more than 25 years old. And you know, that's a pretty old code base, and it's been modified a lot of times. So you can say that it's definitely going to you know, require a you know, good cleanup. If we look at the way the, the code is built, um, we actually uh, built it as one big monolith. Um, even though the local versions, when we built that internally, we have it like an overlayer where we only have the differences, so only the mod files uh, are stored uh, internally. But when we ship it, we ship every country version as one version, one big monolith. Um, and moving to a modern development environment really requires uh, some changes to this. And it actually also requires some changes on, on how we're going to uh, ship this. So the first step in doing this is really to convert everything from CAL to AL, where AL is the new programming language in the modern development environment. And the, the good news here is that we actually have a very powerful tool that can do that. 
It's called text to AL, um, and the process is fully automated. And we are actually able today uh, to convert the entire W1 application in one go like this. So we get one big uh, ex extension in AL here. But that's, of course, not, not enough. Um, we, we want to uh, componentize the application code. So we want to get away with this big monolith uh, and create small components that you can update individually and, and integrate to. We're going to start with the bottom and work our way f up through the stack of the application because this is a pretty substantial uh, task to do all that. We start with the system layer, uh, which is really what is in code unit one today. Uh, you've probably seen that a number of times. Um, there's some configuration, there's a, you know, how to control the overall behavior. Not something that usually you would want to customize when, when you're in a SaaS solution, but on prem, of course, it's something that you can customize. The next step is to create an application foundation, which is small, reusable components uh, that, that can be used all over the, the, the entire application. Uh, it could be examples like you know, the job queue. It could be something like rapid start. It could be something like even number series management. You know, or you can take any code unit that we have in the system today that's called something, something management. You know, that, that's a good candidate for what should go into this uh, foundation layer. And when we build this, you know, we want to you know, build it as well-defined components. And of course, we want to build them in extensions in AL. They need to be extensible, so you as partners can you know, extend it. But actually, we also want to build them so you as partners can completely replace them. If you adhere to the contract of that component, you, know, you can build your own version and replace it, our version with your version. And of course, in the, in the process of doing this, we're going to update all our tests and, and continue to ship these uh, as we've done before. The next step is, uh, you know, it sounds easy, um, but this is actually really hard. But we want to, of course, just componentize the rest of the application. Um, we're going to start again from the bottom uh, with the general ledger or, or the finance area. Um, and, and the components here will kind of match the domain areas in the business domain. So you can imagine that there are, there are multiple uh, components within finance, uh, some in sales, purchasing, invoicing, manufacturing, you name it. And again, here we build them in extensions. You know, we make them extensible uh, so you can extend them. Uh, we make them replaceable. So if you want to create your own sales module, you, know, you can definitely do that. Um, and of course, we'll include the tests here as well. So we also have our local versions. Um, and we also want to break them up into extensions. And the good news here about the local versions is that for most parts, local versions is really about adding local features to the W1 version. So uh, what we're going to do here is to move the local features to extensions as well. But we want to move them not just one big extensions, uh, but one e extension per local feature. In that process, I'm sure we're going to find some uh, functionality that's common for all languages uh, or all local versions. And we're, of course, going to consolidate that into the W1 version or the W1 components uh, that it is now. So they can kind of be reused in, in, uh, in more countries. We actually already did that for the Danish localization. So today, uh, if you look at the code base, the Danish localization is actually four different extensions that we created. There's a little bit left over still in, in the, you know, the localization layer. Uh, that's a difference between W1 and the Danish version, but we're going to clean that up as well in this talk. We also want to clean up the code. And the good news here is um, that AL actually has built-in uh, code analyzers. Um, you know, and and uh, we're going to adhere to these code analyzers. And we're actually going to continue uh, to evolve them over time as well um, and, and fix the errors uh, as we go here. Uh, right now, we have four different code analyzers. Uh, the major one is uh, one called CodeCop. Um, it is uh, general rules uh, that, that is applicable across the, the entire application. Then you have one called UICOP, which is specific for the user experience. 
Um, and then you have two, which is really specific uh, analyzers for, you know, if you want to put your app or your extension uh, on App Source. Um, and the other one is for creating pertinent extensions. So there are certain rules you need to adhere to there. And of course, you know, in that process, we're also going to do, uh, you know, a, a major code review on, on the code to ensure that uh, it's good quality. Another thing we want to do is that we want to move the code to GitHub because we actually want to create our application as an open source application. So every time we create a new component, every time we create a new extension, we will move it to GitHub. And this will allow you to actually contribute directly to the development of these components. Not just sending emails to people you know inside Microsoft or you know, whatever uh, you, you can do to influence us to, to uh, actually change the, the code. No, you simply go clone the repo, make your modifications, submit a pull request, and if you know, we will accept that pull request, you know, there'll be someone in, in, in my team that will actually be looking at the pull request. And uh, if it's accepted, your change goes directly into the next version of the product. It's that easy. So, and if you look actually, if you go to uh, github.com, Microsoft uh, slash AL app extensions, you can actually see uh, the four extensions we have on the screen here. Uh, the, the C5 migration uh, extension, the business headlines is the one that, that shows the, the headlines uh, in, in, in the UI, uh, image analysis for machine learning, uh, and sales and inventory forecast. So we actually already have four extensions, and you're very welcome to go there already today and, and uh, take a look at the code, try it out on, on your local box, uh, make a modification, uh, and make the pull requests. There's someone in the other end that's listening. I'm sure about that. So with this, I believe that um, we have uh, modernized the application code, or we will modernize the application code. But what we are essentially creating is a modern develop application platform, because we want this to be a platform for you to build your solution upon. And we want you to be able to pick and choose which components from that platform that you want to use and which ones you want to replace. And you know, the platform is highly componentized. It can, it's extensible for you. Uh, it's high quality and it's open source. And, and, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, when we are done with this, it'll probably take some time, uh, we will have an application platform that will last for years. So the application platform or is not the only thing that uh, we want to modernize. Uh, we actually also want to modernize the user experience. And you got a small glimpse of that uh, last year on the, the, the UI. But I'd like to invite uh, Rina up here to talk more about how we can modernize the user experience. Thank you, Boxing. So it is true, yes, uh, last year on this stage, we have actually spoken uh, about the modern experience. And what we have showed you was uh, a couple of mock-ups uh, prepared by our design team, illustrating our North Star from user experience point of view. And this time around, we're actually going to show you live demos, how the new look and feel beautifully lights up into the product, seamlessly integrated across, across all pages. But before uh, I show you the live demos, I would like to talk about the journey of Modena into the product. And for those of you who don't know, Modena is actually our code name for, for the UX Refresh project. Uh, you know, that is what we do in Microsoft. You know, we have interesting projects and then we uh, think a lot about uh, cool names for those projects. And uh, Modena came actually from Modern Nav uh, sorry, it's uh, VC at that point was, was not a, a brand for us. Uh, so that's how uh, early stage we actually thought about modernizing the experience. So um, how did the Moderna journey started? Um, it started with the financials newspaper layout um, that we have uh, talked about last year. And it has been a very busy year for us where we have continuously reiterated through the mock-ups and I have pasted here on the slides uh, a couple of sketches directly from the UX lab 
showing how uh, the journey started with the layout. And we have carefully considered uh, how the elements should be rendered in this new page layout across all page types, not just row center and so on. And I, what I want to emphasize also is that some of these new paradigms that we have introduced in Modena, they're not just something we have come up with. We have actually had a lot of user testing and I have uh, pasted uh, on the slide some quotes from the, te uh, from the users that participated in the tests. And also, uh, for being authentic, I have pasted uh, the test results from, from one of the user studies to show you guys that we had a lot of green scenarios, uh, but we also had yellow and red, indicating areas and scenarios that we need to improve. And from engineering point of view, we have uh, basically uh, implemented these components based on modern web technologies. They are designed with accessibility in mind. Uh, we have slowly integrated them into the product. We started with modernizing the role center, and then we started, for example, uh, as you can see in this screenshot, so we started with the headline functionality, then we introduced the theming and, uh, with fonts and colors, then the navigation bar and action bar and so forth. So, on overall, a lot of detail uh, and uh, craftsmanship has been put in this, and uh, we have carefully looked at how to make every detail shine. And our design team has done a great job. Uh, they have actually prepared for us a video that I would like to invite you to watch, um, illustrating the key Modena capabilities. So let's play it. That was a very nice video. Uh, and what you just saw, I can assure you, has been really built with passion for the perfect. And one more thing I would like to say is that at the end of the day, it is for us, it, it's all about you, about your customers, and about the feedback that we get from you. Uh, and that is why the modern experience doesn't just come with you know, a, a new set of uh, UI components and some UX paradigms. Uh, and some fresh paint on the page. It actually comes with a lot of productivity features. Uh, and during the demo, I would also point out um, what it means to work mouse free in Business Central. So with that, uh, I will show you the product. So let me switch. All right. So I have here my Business Central tenant. Uh, and I am uh, in the clean and elegant experience, and um, I am looking at the role center. Uh, and let's pause here for a bit. I know that this looks like, a, you know, when you see it first time, it looks like, wow, it is, it is really a big change. But uh, in fact, it's, it's actually the same content, uh, but mm, rendered in a different way. 
Um, and the way Crow Center is organized is as a business news site. So notice that uh, on the top of the page, we have the navigation bar. And the navigation bar used to be on the left. Um, we have had uh, a lot of feedback from new users that they actually could not find the activity groups. Uh, and that is why right now uh, the activity groups are uh, laid uh, on the top of the page, um, available and easily accessible. And then uh, on the next uh, row, we have also thought about uh, adding space for the, the, your most important list, like customers, vendors, uh, and so on. And after that, what it draws our attention is, uh, is the inside part. Um, so the inside part is, is a new concept in, in Modena. And uh, it is not just meant to give you an overview of the business. Uh, it is actually meant to guide users uh, to, to, to take uh, uh, decisions, to prioritize their tasks. Uh, and for example, I can right now drill down in, in this insight and uh, get some context on, uh, for example, how, how was that uh, insight uh, uh, surfaced. Um, and after that, I can also navigate back. And whilst I'm looking at my insights, I have the actions on, on the right, right hand side. So I can easily, for example, once I saw the insight, I can also uh, uh, react fast and uh, um, click on the actions. And uh, on the page lower, we have the activities group. And notice that here also there is a new rendering uh, concept, which is different. Uh, we have introduced a wide layout um, for the Q groups, mm, which is primarily intended for financial KPIs. Uh, and if you would like to, for example, find more information uh, about how to uptake these new uh, concepts into your solutions, I invite you to join uh, Thomas and Andrea's uh, session uh, about clients uh, on Friday. And Let's move on. Uh, also, you see the old uh, way of rendering the, the queues, and uh, um, that is primarily now kept for operational KPIs. And now, I would like to take a look at my top five customers. So let's see. And notice that on the ca uh, customer card, I have the paper type layout, which is uh, one of the Moderna signatures. And the edit, new, and delete button has been moved uh, uh, on the top of the page, primarily for simplifying the, um, the uh, ribbon experience, the actions experience. And you also probably, probably noticed a big change, the fact that the uh, ribbon is not present uh, uh, anymore. We're, it was uh, uh, really overwhelming for, for new users. Uh, it was introducing a lot of clutter on the page. And that is why we have replaced it with a new veranda component, which we uh, internally call the action bar. Uh, the action bar has been designed with the goal of focusing the users on the promoted actions, on the tasks that they do most frequently on their daily uh, work. And uh, that is why the promoted actions are here on the left side. And there is, of course, uh, the, the option of uh, finding the non-promoted uh, parts and uh, you can drill down into the action groups. And if you uh, would like to uh, uh, see the uh, action bar in the expanded state, you can always uh, uh, click on pin it. But now, uh, let me just uh, create an invoice. And, and I will add a line. And whilst I'm adding the line, I actually noticed that the lines uh, action has also moved. They moved where they originally belonged to, uh, close to the subpage. Uh, if you remember previously, the lines actions, they were in the main header ribbon, and the user had all the time had to switch between context between lines and ribbon, lines ribbon, and so forth. Um, so that is a, a, a great improvement. And now I am done with editing my line. And uh, I would like to create it one more time, but this time uh, mouse free. So let me arrow down and now tab. And now I'm going to press one of the shortcuts that we have recently introduced in Web Client, which is F8. So, uh, <laughs> so I, you know, during this session, I will probably show a couple of shortcuts, but I 
personally um, have, we can say, the relationship with the F8 uh, because that was actually the first feature I work on when I joined the uh, NFV team. And, you know, I was a junior engineer at that point, and I've been told, you know, we cannot ship the Windows client without the F8 shortcut. And I'm like, oh, my God, really? How much time do I have? Um, so it's really, really nice for me to see it light up uh, in, in web client right now. Uh, so let's, uh, let's finish my, uh, let's press F8 one more time. And that's it. My line is ready. And now I am going to release it. And notice how now the system, as I'm done with my invoice, the system invites me to, to uh, see all the other invoices uh, that I have. And um, I can go back and forth uh, with the next and previous buttons. This, uh, we have added very smooth uh, uh, transitions between, between the pages. Um, and before, next and previous button was almost never used uh, because they were in an obscure place in the ribbon and uh, users could not really uh, find them. Now, uh, one of the goals of Moderna was to actually modernize the navigation experience. And uh, that is why those next and previous button now come to the front. Uh, together, also, if you notice a very tiny detail, we have also introduced the back button and removed the X, uh, X uh, button. Okay, so um, let's uh, go back to the role center. And now I would like to visit chart of accounts. So, um, chart of accounts is uh, obviously a list uh, page, and it also has the Moderna uh, key elements, the navigation bar, the action bar, and so, and so on. Uh, but what I would like to do now, I would like to switch gears and talk about how you can filter down the lines in your list pages. And another shortcut that uh, at least I know uh, is uh, Alt F3. And what does Alt F3 does? Basically, it... Uh, uh, filters down the uh, list to the value that is currently selected. Uh, for those of you who use Windows kind of a lot, you probably know about filter to this value. It, it's kind of the same concept. And in the same time, notice that we also slide in the filter pane. So the filter pane uh, is, has been modeled uh, in, in such a way that we carefully balance the learnability, usability with, uh, with the powerfulness of the advanced filter, filter functionality. And, um, and we have looked uh, at a lot of uh, uh, modern websites uh, like e-commerce sites and web shops uh, and get inspired uh, from how, how uh, to build uh, a modern filter experience. And of course, we can also, for example, uh, uh, change the filter to any criteria. I can decide to see all the, um, all the, all the items from 40,000 and up. And uh, for the uh, advanced users, we also support uh, limit totals. So, um, for, uh, so limit totals, uh, you know, basically it doesn't work on one column. It works on, on several columns. And... Um, you can uh, slice the data and you can uh, use it for ad hoc analysis. And um, so we are very happy to uh, introduce this, uh, this powerful feature in, uh, in, uh, in web client as well. So let me show you um, the net, uh, how the net change and balance, not if they have changed, um, they all become uh, zero or empty. Um, so... There is also the option, so if I'm not happy with the filters, how I uh, set them up, and I would just want to go back to the previous state, I can also just uh, uh, reset the filters and uh, I will have uh, my original state. So there is a lot of functionality in filter pane um, that I won't be drilling into it right now. Uh, it also has uh, a mouse-free experience. Um, and all the, all the uh, um, features uh, on filter that, that you know that uh, NAV comes with, they, they are also supported. But now um, I would like to switch to uh, another feature that is also quite important and um, um, requested a lot. 
So um, I remember when we traveled here, Vincent was asking me, okay, do you know uh, if we have uh, uh, chairs registered into our system? And I said, yes, let me look. Uh, so I press F3 and I uh, search for chair. And here I have all the list uh, of the chairs and uh, I would like to select them. Uh, so how do I do that? I place uh, shift arrow down and notice how now uh, all the rows uh, get selected mouse free. And then I simply, pray, pay, uh, I simply use control C and uh, all the rows will be now available in, uh, in the clipboard. And because I would like to send them in an email, I can decide to paste them here and notice how we copy data with high fidelity. So it's not that we just paste the raw values, we actually paste the uh, HTML format, the font colors and so on. So you have your data just like it is shown in Business Central directly into your inbox. And you can actually copy to Excel as well, as, as you probably are wondering. And you can also uh, yeah, basically paste inside Business Central between lists uh, uh, and so on. All this uh, functionality is supported uh, today. And now um, let me show you one more feature. Um, let's open the item card. And I know that, for example, we have received uh, two, three more chairs uh, uh, on Munich's swivel chairs, and uh, I would like to adjust uh, the inventory. And um, I'm not really sure how to do that. Uh, I have not done it before. And I know that, for example, the light bulb is contextual, so I can uh, click on it and type uh, adjust. And notice how uh, the tell me feature now uh, fills out the page with uh, the search results. And I can see, for example, that there is a section uh, which is contextual to my page on the item card, and there is actually a, an action called adjust inventory. And uh, there is also a tooltip for it in case I am wondering if that is the right action. What if instead of one I have two or three? And there is also in this page, um, there is uh, a page and report section, and that looks uh, familiar to you probably. Um, and the explanation is because Tell Me Features is uh, built upon uh, page and report uh, search functionality. So why have we done that? Um, that is because we always had this scenario where you know the user knows what to do, but don't know how to or where to find that particular action. And we looked around and see how, how other uh, product uh, in Microsoft uh, solved that, and the Office team has actually solved it uh, with Tell Me feature. Uh, and this is what we have done here. We brought Tell Me uh, to Business Central. And the documentation section, that, that's also something new. Uh, we right now uh, are indexing uh, the documentation pages from the help site and the documentation search is powered by Azure search services. Uh, so basically searching through documentation should be uh, fast, but, uh, blazing fast. Um, yes, yeah, so if I would like, for example, right now to verify, okay, am I adjusting the inventory in the right way? or I or read more about it, I can just open the link into a, a, a side tab. So that was Tell Me feature uh, in a nutshell. Actually, there's one more uh, important detail. Uh, that is that we have also a shortcut for, uh, for Tell Me feature, uh, and that is Alt-Q. Um, that's also going to become, you know, fairly uh, addictive to you. I, I use it quite a lot. In fact, I use it more than F8, even though I, I like F8 a lot. Um, so I hope you will also be using it in your solutions. Yes. Um, so that was, uh, that was the last feature I had in my demos uh, for uh, Modena experience. Uh, and before I, I wrap up, uh, I would like to share with you two more features uh, that actually are not in the product just yet. Uh, but I would like to give you a taste of where our focus is for the spring release uh, and what is coming. So let's, uh, let's go to chart of accounts again. And this time let's look at total assets. 
and let's uh, let's go through general ledger entries. So for those of you who use general ledger entries, you probably know that that is a very, very big list with a lot of records. And we have gotten a lot of feedback from, uh, from users that um, uh, were trying different scenarios. And in some cases, uh, uh, they found the performance not optimal. And uh, what we have done, uh, we have re-architected our grid control to uh, take advantage of modern technologies uh, like virtual DOM. And uh, that allow us to page, uh, page in and page out the content while scrolling. Uh, so now uh, our, um, our list will scroll smoothly and fast, uh, no matter how many records we have loaded, whether that's uh, 10, 100, or uh, I don't know, 500,000, whatever. So it doesn't matter for us right now uh, how big the list is, which is, uh, which is really great. And uh, for the other feature, I will have to come back to my PowerPoint. Let's see. Yes. Oh, and where's my clicker? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the other feature, it is called uh, Page Inspector. Um, so I'm sure that many of you use uh, about this page a lot. And uh, we have uh, gotten also requests from you about bringing about this page in, in web clients. Uh, however, you know, we, we never just bring features on par uh, from Windows client to web client. We always uh, uh, want to have a modern experience uh, and, and, you know, bring this experience uh, uh, to, to a different level. And that is uh, how we basically envision Page Inspector. Um, so basically it is an action uh, in the uh, shell um, af after the design uh, and personalize. And when you uh, click on that action, it will slide in the page inspector pane. And the experience will be uh, just as it is with the designer. Uh, you basically are hovering over or, or, or pointing to a field. And then on the right hand side, you will see all the information you need uh, for troubleshooting page filters, um, for example, uh, table filters. And also, what we have introduced new is that you will be able to see the list of extensions that are modifying this field. So that could be quite useful, uh, at least in customization cases. So um, now uh, we will show, I will show you a video that is the, prepared by the development team. It is a very early stage prototype of uh, how the page inspector could look. Uh, so, so let me start it to just get a feeling uh, about how experience is going to be. So notice how the context uh, will change depending on which row you are on. And also if um, we will change to at some point to the fact box, notice that you would see how the page filters will, uh, will be updated uh, showing the subform link filters and so on. So um, yeah. That, that was uh, the last feature I, I wanted to show. Um, so Page Inspector is uh, a very powerful feature for, for troubleshooting. And um, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to make use of it uh, in your solutions when we have it available. And it will really, really play nice with all the application lifecycle management tools uh, that we are also having available in Business Central today. Again, we are striving to provide a modern experience, and that's not just for proficient users and customers, but it's also for our partners. And I'd like to invite Aida to tell us about uh, modern application lifecycle management tools. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question why, while Ida is preparing. So if I'm a developer, how much, um, quick question, how much do I need to do to get all this modern experience? How much things I need to change in my application? To, not, uh, not very much, actually. To, to get uh, the modern experience. Actually, modern experience is, is cheap. You don't need to change anything in order to get it. Of course, there are some, uh, some new paradigm that you might want to uptake in order for getting the optimal experience. But uh, in general, that, that will, they will just light up in our solution. So everything will light up in Modena? Yes. All right. Thank you. And Thank it you. will light up both on cloud and the on-premise version. All right. Great. Yes. Thank you, Irina. Yeah. Aida? Uh, oh, yeah. I need to log on, of yeah, course. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. It's nice. You log on. So let's see how you as partner can 
perform your management and administrative tasks on a business central ten tenant in a quite modern way. So let me get us started and change to this monitor. Yeah, I can do that for you. There you go. Good. So I am in the very familiar partner center and uh, I have selected the list of the, the customer that I would like to perform some administrative tasks for. And you are familiar with some of the op options we have here. I can manage subscriptions. I can go and manage my licenses, add and remove users. But the area that we would like to visit today is the service management. And let me visit this area. Yeah, it seems like it's uh, slipping. We try to wake it up. Cool. So we have a brand new link here, Dynamics 365 Business Central. Let me uh, start this. It takes a second. And what you are going to see on this uh, screen is the new and brand new portal that we are introducing with Business Central. And you can notice that it has the same beautiful URL, businesscentral.dynamics.com, your tenant ID. If you want to navigate this into this brand new portal, you can just uh, use a slash admin. And of course, you need to have the delegated admin access in order to just directly jump to this portal, or you can navigate to it from the partner center. So this portal is the place that we are going to enable many, many scenarios for you. So you can use, your, um, you can use this portal to help your customer. And we are planning to enable many of those scenarios in future, but for some of those scenarios, the future is today. So let me go to the environment that I have created for this customer. And if you remember, Vincent mentioned that we are rolling out 100 and 100 new features into Business Central in a very uh, regular cadence. But how your customers are going to uh, receive all these beautiful features, for example, page inspector in a spring release, and we are pushing all these changes without them being uh, disturbed in their normal working uh, days and w business hours. This is one of the features that you have asked us a lot to be able to enable uh, in order your customers can receive the upgrade in a seamless way. And the admin portal can help you to implement this scenario. So let me navigate to upgrade settings to define an upgrade window. Here is the window that Microsoft, that you define, and Microsoft will be pushing updates to this customer uh, without distracting the customer. So I'm going to set the time to the local customer time. Okay, let me set it from here on this four, and I'm going to save it. So this setting now is preserved. And I need to have, great. The setting is now preserved in the proud environment. So we are going to respect this upgrade window when we are pushing innovation into customer world. But what about if you want to uh, stay on top of the changes and on top of the changes that we are pushing into the business central, uh, you can subscribe to the notifications that Microsoft is uh, sending to you. And here is a notification area. For example, when we are um, pushing updates into the business central, we are going to send notification to the emails, in this case to Luke, uh, to the emails that are listed on this portal so you will know instantly that the tenant is going to get upgraded 
and uh, if it is required, you reach the customer or take necessary actions. Another area that I would like to talk about is troubleshooting. As you know, many times things doesn't go as we are expected to, and uh, when that happens, you would like to know uh, what is going on on the customer center. You want to get an insight. What are the features that they are using? What are the extensions that they are interacting with? And most important of all, what are the uh, errors that they are hitting live on the daily basis? So let me go navigate to the telemetry area here. And here, I can actually choose a base point in time. And I can enter the number of minutes. Let me just put it to 500 minutes that I can go back and forth from that point in time. Um, and uh, when I do that, so I will get the telemetry that is coming from this tenant within that time span. So here you go. I have the telemetry. I, have, uh, I can see the list of the objects and actions that the user is performing. If there was any error messages, I could see those error messages. And in some cases, uh, I can just be proactive about it, right? Contact the uh, customer and maybe help them to fix the issue. Maybe it is just a matter of reconfiguration of some areas in the business center. Another possibility that you have here, you can see the extensions that the customer is interacting with. Which, and if some of these extensions are causing a specific error messages, you can also contact with the third party provider that is providing this extension and inform them on the issue, then they can fix it. So this is how you can get uh, a quite detailed insight into what your customer are doing. But what if there is a specific pain point that you need to troubleshoot? Um, in that case, you can't just do it in the production environment. You need an isolated environment with kind of the same setup in order to be able to reproduce this issue. So for that, we have also introduced a new option for you that I'm going to demonstrate. So this customer has a production environment. Now, when I'm going to create a sandbox tenant, we have uh, introduced an option, coffee production environment data into the sandbox. So I'm going to select it and kick a start creating my sandbox tenant with the exact replica of the production data. So after a few minutes, I will have this sandbox tenant ready and I can start reproducing the problem and possibly use of very mo modern tools like a wonderful debugger in order to debug and see what is the part the partner issue. Vincent, do you want to show us how I can do that? Sure. So just to recap here what, um, just to recap what we are seeing here, right? We have a, a customer with um, a deployment in the cloud mm -hmm. and the business central is running in the cloud and uh, you showed us how you can manage you know when the up upgrades are, are are rolled out to to this customer and where we you can pick windows where the customer doesn't get disturbed by the upgrade process you showed us telemetry so hopefully telemetry can help you detect any anomaly something going wrong mm -hmm. um, on, on on this tenant and the next thing you want to do is, of course, debug and figure out what's going on with this tenant. Is there something you know you can you can do about it? You get a, already a pretty good indication from from the partner portal uh, on the telemetry log, but that doesn't exactly replace true debugging. So now you've done it. You've made a copy of um, of the tenant, the production mm -hmm. tenant, and we know that you know that's the feedback you gave us. Uh, we, we had the sandbox feature, we introduced that a, a while ago already, but the sandboxes didn't have real data, real customer data. And we know that some of, the, some of the bugs you have, some of the problems you have, are only reproducible with real customer data. So that, that's what you just show us, you, you copied all the data. So now I'm, already, I'm all set up, I have, a, I have a sandbox in the cloud 
which n is not going to disturb my customer, and I can go and do some debugging. Ah, let's see. Right? So let's see how, how that goes. So I'll, this, is, this is my extension that I had before, very, you know, very dull extension with just one procedure reacting on email, email change. And let's, let's imagine that, that uh, there's a bug in it. By the way, how many of you are putting bugs in your code? Raise your hand. Okay, if you, if you are a developer <laughs> and you didn't raise your hand, you are probably lying. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, it's part of, um, unfortunately, it's part of a developer's life, uh, fixing bugs. Actually, that there, are, there are a few studies showing that um, we do spend a lot of time debugging, and depends how you study it, but it's, you know, on the, on the optimistic side, it's about 50% of the time. There are two major tools. If you ask developers, you know, what are the tools they spend the most time in, the number one is usually the editor, and the number two is the debugger. So these are the tools we like to have very sharp in our toolbox, right? Yeah, but so if we have any of uh, those developers in the audience that they can prove to us that they have never produced any bug, we are hiring. By yeah, the way. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so this is my extension. Uh, I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Let's imagine I want to debug. Uh, I don't have a bug in this one because I don't do bug. But but uh, I'm going to put a breakpoint anyway. And, and uh, so you, when I deployed this extension before, you see, um, I told you I, I hit uh, Control F5. So if you look at uh, what it does, Control F5 uh, builds a package and deploys the extension without attaching a debugger. But this time I'm going to go F F5, which is actually going to do the same thing. Um, and uh, let me see, I get an error here. So wha what's going on here is I'm doing the same thing than before, but this time instead of um, instead of deploying uh, without attaching the debugger, uh, I'm going to attach the debugger to my uh, sandbox running in the cloud. So just to be clear, what's running here, what you see is business central in the cloud. The code is executing in the cloud of my extension, and my code is local on uh, on my uh, on my laptop here. So I'm debugging locally, but the code is executing in the cloud. And uh, to prove to you I'm not lying, I'm just going to go and run the same scenario before, just edit the, um, the email. And you can see in the, the, the Visual Studio uh, code icon is flashing, meaning it requires uh, my attention. And here it is, I've hit the breakpoint uh, I put before. So I can go here, and uh, it's a fully fledged debugger. I can go and inspect variables, uh, like the record variables here. I can see what's what value in it. And I can add watches here. You see I've had it uh, a couple of watches if I want to monitor some specific variables. Um, and of course, I can step through my code with F10 and step into uh, calls through F11, like, uh, you know, it's pretty standard key uh, shortcuts for, for debugger. But if I, if I, con no, so if I continue to, uh, to step uh, further, You'll see what happens here. I get out of my extension, and I get into uh, the base app code because that's you know that's where the code returns after my extension is finished executing, after the event is finished triggered. I go back to the code here, and what you're seeing here is the CL code of the base app. So I can I cannot modify it obviously, uh, but I can I can look at it. And the reason why we introduce that feature is that we know it's important when you debug to have the context in which your call is getting called. Uh, so you know what's happening before and what's happening after, and that's usually very useful for, for debugging. We have the full call stack. We I can also go, you know, just like in my own code, I can go and inspect the variables. You know, this one has a value 60,000 something. Uh, you can put breakpoint here as well in the CL code. Um, you know, usually when you debug, you, you run the scenario once and you figure out, okay, I want to rerun it and put a breakpoint in another place uh, where it's more relevant for, for doing my debugging. So you can do that also in the CL code. So um, really, really powerful debugging experience uh, we, we, have, we have here. Um, now, this is just the tip of, uh, uh, of the iceberg regarding the modern uh, development. There's a lot more to it, and I recommend you attend the... Uh, the Western UAL development session if you want to know more about development environment. I think it's happening right after this. Yeah, keynote. it's right after this, uh, right after the keynote. Mm -hmm.
Okay, Ida. Uh, now we, uh, we we look at the we look at the um, we look at the, the, the whole debug uh, debugging experience and how you can manage your tenants in the cloud. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what's going on under the hood and what's going on you know behind the scenes? Yeah, absolutely. Let All us right. uh, switch. Okay, now let's have a peek under the hood of Business Central Service. I'm not going to say which car engine is that. It belongs to one of our partners. We will find out. Maybe somebody will tweet about that. <laughs> but I would say a peek under the hood of Business Central because we are actually having a fully fledged session where we are going walking through all those scenarios and all those services on Friday at 1 o'clock. Christian and Esteban are going to show that. But I just provide you an overview. So let's see. This is the global map of the world. And now it's the global map of our data planes. Data planes, they are the collection of the clusters that a store of customer data and process them. As you know, Business Central is supporting 29 countries and there are more in the pipeline. When we are launching each of these countries, it is very important for us that we are saving the customer data in Azure data centers that is close to the customer. And it also, it is in the same privacy and compliance region as the customer is. You know, in Microsoft, we are a little bit obsessed about privacy and uh, data safety. And that is why we have laid out of data planes according to um, privacy regions. So you can see that there are two data planes in Europe, and they are supported by four Azure data centers. And by the way, these data centers are not the uh, esp special sovereign clouds that are used by governments and some of public sector and some other agencies. They are publicly standard available Azure data centers with all the API and the beautiful services, Azure services that we are actually using them extensively and I will cover that a little bit more later. You might have also noticed that we have two data planes in Europe. The reason is we have many, many countries, quite few, and there are many more in the pipeline. And it's very important for us that we are a splitting of service into the segment. So when we are rolling out the changes, we can roll, it, roll them out in the stages and upgrade one segment without affect, affecting the rest. It's something that we do very well in Microsoft, and we call it internally safe deployment practices. So this is about Europe. You can see that we have a data plane in Canada uh, supporting of Canadian customers. And we also have a data plane in US supporting of United States and Mexican customers. You, you might notice that we have four data centers in US. Why? Because we have many, many, many it's a lot, I can share it with you, but of number of customers in US is quite a lot. So we need to load balance this tenant between these four available data center to accommodate the capacity that is required to run these customers. And we have another data plane that is a hosting of African and Asian customers. And you can see in this data plane today we have South Africa, South Korea, and also we have United Arab Emirates, and very recently we have on onboarded Hong Kong and Taiwan. And just, uh, I, I think it was yesterday evening that it was announced that we are hosting also of uh, Singapore uh, customers in this data plane. And the last not least, we have Oce uh, Oceania, which is supporting of uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, customers. So a lot of countries, a lot of deployment, and let's see how we are going to manage all these countries and all these deployments. That is when it comes to the control planes. 
So, if you look at control planes, they are a collection of microservices. Each microservice is serving its own purpose, and they are doing a very a specific tasks, like they are upgrading, they are provisioning, they are signing up, and uh, helping to scale and monitoring, and many, many other critical operations. So all these microservices are built on Azure Service Fabric, and they are managed by Azure Service Fabri Fabric. And you can see that we have quite a few of them. And each region has the collection of these microservices we call regional services. Why? It is following the same guideline as privacy regions. So we also deploy our control plane, which is group of these microservices in all privacy region areas of the world. Not only it helps uh, uh, to respect the data boundaries, because we want to keep the data, and when we are processing data within the same area, but also we make sure that there is no latency issues. So this is a little bit about the services, but if I want to make some example of this, uh, let's look at, for example, tenant upgrader service. What does this do? This, is, this uh, service helps to uh, schedule and trigger the upgrade jobs that is rolling out the changes into the business central clusters. And if you remember, I show you the upgrade window. That is how it helps to schedule these upgrade jobs, because it also goes and look at the settings that you have set, or your customer has set on the, um, on the specific tenant, so it respects that upgrade window and makes sure that the uh, upgrades are happening in outside the business hours. We have another one called Health Monitor. What that does, it looks at the fleet of all the tenants that we have across all the clusters within a specific region. And if there is a, any unhealthy ping, it will fire an alert. And that will actually uh, wakes up or informs uh, of on-call DevOps engineer who immediately looks at the issue and tries to mitigate that issue. And the last slide, Nith, I'm going to introduce the latest addition to our uh, expanding list of microservices that might be a little bit more close to your heart. That is extension validation service. So this is quite an intelligent service. What it does, it goes across all the clusters within the region, compiles the pertinent extensions against our upcoming uh, application. Uh, base application, and if there is any compatibility issue, there is any breaking changes, it sends notification to the partner. So you know in advance that there would be a breaking change or a compatibility issue, and you can address it before Microsoft is rolling out the changes. And by the way, it will use the notification service, and this notification service is the same notification service that you can subscribe to and also send notification as a, uh, about upgrades. So it all uh, works together. I would like also to show you the global services. We have a couple of them. So what are these global services? These global services, they are the entry point to our service. They are kind of dataless services. They don't uh, store any data. What they do is mostly they are routing the information. For example, when you are logging in or signing up. And one of these services that might also be the service that actually, if you are working with Business Central every day, you are making many, many calls to that service every day. That is fixed client endpoint. The fixed client endpoint enables all the users, all of you, all the users of Business Central to only need to remember one and only one URL, uh, businesscentral.dynamics.com. And it will look at the service, will look at the user credential, and based on that, it will find out that what is the data, what is the control plane, what is the data plane, and what is the tenant that this customer needs to get re redirected to, and then the customer gets redirected to beautiful, modern web client. So, a little bit about that, but I have one more thing. 
you know. It is all about data, and you hear that a lot. Uh, it eventually, when it comes to it, if you think about it, it is about intaking the data, it is about processing the data, it is about uh, storing the data, and it is about analyzing this data. And the amount of data, I would like just to share some number with you, so you can see the amount of data that of control planes and data planes are generating. And we are just in the beginning of the journey of analyzing, processing this data, understanding how our service is operating and trying to adjust and optimize. So let me share some numbers with you. So every three minutes, I can share with you the number of tenants. You can do as many maths you want to do today, but every three minutes, one the business central tenant is getting provisioned. And 30,000 is the number of calls per hour that of global services that are routing the information uh, <coughs> are receiving. And look at that, it's 405K. This is the amount of metrics that of service emits per minute. And close to eight terabytes of logs. This is the amount of logs that we generate every day. And close to four terabytes of data per day, we upload it to Cosmos. You might heard a bit about Cosmos. It is our internal big data system that some of the technologies and uh, principles that use in Cosmos is also available in Azure Data Lake, publicly available. So, this is all where it all comes together, and we are having a lot of things to do with some of this data. But also, it's all about the technologies. As of today, we are using 20 Azure technology to make sure that we are operating our service beautifully, intelligently, and efficiently. So, Thomas, uh, walk us through the journey that we have come so far, and also of cloud journey. And uh, we have invested a lot, especially in the last two, three years, to make sure that we are modernizing the architecture in a way that we have a, a scalable, easy to deploy, easy to upgrade cloud service. So all that you of amazing developer community of partners can focus on is just on customization, uh, on building um, awesome extensions and adding value. So this is a, lo a little bit about today, and uh, I also would like to hear a little bit more about maybe tomorrow. So Vincent, do you have something to share with us about future? Yep, yep. thank you, Aida. Thank you for this, uh, for this peek behind the scenes. <laughs> so as you can see, um, as Ida mentioned, we started this journey to the cloud a while ago, and uh, you know, one one could be a little bit naive and think it's just you know, what about you know, what is this thing, cl this cloud thing? Just you know, put a VM out there and put the product on it. Well, that's a little more complicated than that, as it turned out, um, as Ida just uh, showed us. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of complexity, of um, um, to to have to operate a service like this one and have uh, resiliency have, you know, um, reliability of the service, security, and, you know, geolocation, and there's also some legal issues. So, you know, a lot of moving parts, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things to do to operate that service. Now, we have, traditionally, at the keynote, we have a section called Formula Lab, where we talk a little bit about um, what we have um, in store, with some, some things we have been, you know, working on, on the side, some prototypes, uh, something that might make it to the product or might not make it to the product. And when, uh, when you say lab, you know, uh, m most people have this image of, um, you know, a chemistry lab, something like uh, what's on that picture here uh, with intricate, you know, equipment and weird contraption like this. I don't know what these guys are doing, but uh, it's definitely blue. Um, <laughs> so, uh, o of course, we, you know, we're, it's soft we're doing software, so we don't have a lab like this one. Um, we actually, ha our lab actually looks like this one. This is our lab at Microsoft. No, actually, it, uh, it's not, it's, I think it's a computer-generated picture. I wish, I wish we had a lab like this. 
Um, no, we don't have a lab like this one, but we do have, from this year, we do have a real lab. So as you know, uh, as you might know, if you're interested in quantum computing, uh, if you read about it in the, in the press, Microsoft is, is uh, investing heavily in quantum computing and trying to, uh, to build a quantum computer. And in our, uh, in our very old building where our uh, business central uh, R&D team is, we, um, this year we opened a quantum lab. Uh, so it's a real lab, you know, with, you know, intricate machines like this one. Uh, I don't exactly know what it's for, but it's uh, certainly wrapped uh, in folio in <laughs> for some reason. Um, and so we have, you know, we have researchers from Microsoft here, and they are trying to uh, manufacture qubits. Um, so if you know, uh, bits, as you know, are 0 or 1 in the computer world. In the quantum computer world, qubits, they are 0 and 1 at the same time. Um, so I don't really understand it fully. Uh, all I understand is that they are in this entangled quantum state, which can be both zero and one until you look at them. So when you look at them, they, uh, their state somehow becomes uh, defined. Um, and that's what you want to avoid uh, because you want to keep them in that entangled state uh, as long until you actually need to look at them. And that's what these guys are trying to, to, to do to achieve. They are trying to manufacture these qubits um, in, in large numbers, which is also not easy, and also make sure that they are protected. And, and that's about the extent of uh, what I understand. Um, so <coughs> with these guys, uh, they, they, are, they are located on the, on the ground floor. Um, so this is, this is the, the Microsoft building where the Business Central team is. And this is the quantum lab at the ground floor. And you know, when, when we talk about quantum mechanics, it's always a little bit scary, right? You never know wh when these guys are going to open a black hole or something, you know, something crazy, right? Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit concerned because, you know, this is, this is our, our quantum lab and my desk is actually here. So if they, if, they, if they open a black hole, I'll be one of the first person to actually disappear into it. The only thing what that comforts me, though, is that the sales guys, they're on the second floor. <laughs> so they will disappear before me. Um, but on the other hand, you know, as one of my colleagues pointed out to me the other day, it's like, but I mean, maybe that's not too good. You, you might end up stuck in, a, in, a, in another dimension with the sales guy. You know. um, anyway, I'm just kidding. We love, we love the salespeople, of course, uh, at Microsoft. Um, so quantum computing, um, let me talk a little bit about that because it sounds like, it sounds like you know, science fiction and there's really a lot of problems to solve before we actually can build a quantum computer. Uh, and the qubits thing is just the bottom layer of it. There's a lot of other layers, um, you know, putting them in a chip. It's also a problem that's not solved yet, you know, connecting the qubits to uh, some, you know, uh, some real, you know, uh, electronic connections. We don't have a, an operating system to program it, and we don't even have a language to, to program it. So all these problems, they are, you know, they are all research areas uh, on their own, and, and none of these problems are solved yet. So it seems like you know, it's going to take a long time uh, before we actually have a quantum computer, but maybe not, because there is such a thing called the deception of exponential growth. So it's, uh, you know, naturally uh, the, the human brain tends to uh, project the future linearly. So we look at, you know, the yeah. events and the pace at which they occur, and we think, you know, we instinctively we project these events on the linear, in a linear fashion, and we think, you know, my life is going to be like this. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends how you look at it, uh, events have a tendency to occur at an exponential pace. And that's what, you know, what's called the exponential growth surprise factor. So if you look at history and look at uh, events uh, which have had a profound impact on humanity and you know, things like the printing press or uh, you know, the telephone or the light bulb and put them on the, um, on, on the timeline, you, you'll see that they have a, an exponential growth. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe the quantum computer is not that far away. Uh, uh, and I think, I think that we might have a quantum computer in our lifetime. Um, Business Central is not the type of application we will be running on the quantum computer, obviously. But it's still relevant because, you know, definitely machine learning and artificial intelligence is the future. It's also the future of Business Central. And one can imagine that we'll have business central learning somehow, and we'll have some artificial intelligence and machine learning 
stuff running on a quantum computer, and the possibility apparently are are you know enormous, and nobody really you know know how much he, um, how powerful it's going to be, but it's going to be very very powerful. <coughs> so uh, let's get back to reality and and, and business central. During uh, during the last year or so, since we introduced AL and since we introduced extension, we have been telling you you need to move to AL, you need to move your solution to extension. And as Boxy uh, uh, said before, you know we wouldn't be uh, you know we wouldn't be honest if we didn't do it ourselves. So um, we have we have been working on the exact same thing, taking the base app and and migrating it to AL, um, migrating to to an extension. We are eating our own medicine. So the, the architecture of, um, of uh, Business Central looks roughly like this today. There's a platform, and uh, there is this uh, big CL business uh, base app, Business Central base app on top of that. And this is how the architecture is going to look like in a very, very near future. So still platform, a very thin layer, as uh, Boxy mentioned, a system layer, which probably you don't want to customize. And Everything on top of that is in AL and is in an extension. And actually, it's not a future. We have that running today in our lab, the one on the picture before. Uh, and we managed to convert the entire app. So that's more than 6,000 objects. Uh, it takes roughly 15 minutes to convert and, and, and five minutes to build. And we keep improving the performance of our compiler. Um, so. So this, this is, you know, this is not, we're not fully uh, switching to this yet internally. Uh, it's still uh, at the prototype stage. We need to iron out some, uh, you know, internal build processes, tests, uh, various internal tools we're using before we're actually uh, uh, going to fully uh, switch to that. But, but uh, we, have, we have that working already. Um, that's, that's how we progress towards the, the, the full conversion. We, we did that in, in stages. Uh, started roughly uh, two years ago uh, until this day where, you know, very simply, I think a month ago, we managed to actually build the entire app um, in an extension. So that's, uh, that's how it looks like when you open Seaside, when, when you have converted the OLA. By the way, the, c the conversion process is, uh, is fully automated. It's the, the text to L tool that is uh, it's fully automated. Um, uh, well, well, so that's how. So, when you open the object designer and decide once you run on this conversion, that's how. That's how the. You know, that's how many code units you have left. Uh, just a handful of them, which are uh, basically system code units, and no pages. They all move to uh, to one big extension. Um, for now, we'll still need to do some componentization, but you know, um, that's orthogonal to to the conversion, and and everything is is running smooth and fine in Business Central. So uh, look forward to this, that, that's coming very soon. So before I, I talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the roadmap and where the product is going, but before that, I, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how dedicated we are at Microsoft uh, to Business Central. Uh, as you know, Thomas mentioned and Boxy mentioned before, it's a, this product has a, <coughs> excuse me, a long heritage of more than 30 years. And some of the people uh, in our team have been uh, have been there for you know for a very long time. I really really care about the product. One of our um, one of our developer recently had a 10 years anniversary, and to celebrate, he actually got the Business Central logo tattooed on his forearm. Uh, that's how dedicated we are at Microsoft. And this is a real tattoo. This is not one of these that washes off after a week. You know, he, he's got that for life now. So we better not change the logo again. Huh? <coughs> So that's how dedicated we are. All right, so let's take a look at the roadmap. This fall, we, again, we release, as you know, we release Business Central um, on the cloud and on-prem. And in 2019, um, we, are gonna, we are going to continue to invest in proficiency improvements. Uh, Horina showed you what we have done so far. But we're not, we're not going to stop there. We're going to continue that. There's a lot of things, not more shortcuts we'll introduce. We, we'll improve, keep improving the user the user experience and the UI with the goal of um, retiring the Windows clients in a 12 to 24 months time frame. Um, so in the course of 2020, we'll, uh, we'll switch to the modern client only, which are uh, the web client and uh, the mobile clients. We will uh, also continue our investment in CDS and, and, and data intelligence and machine learning. Um, we already have a few features there. 
but we'll continue that obviously this is this is definitely the future for uh, for this product as this is why it's going to take it to the next level um, the modern development story there's still some work to do it's getting you know better and better every day it's really cool today uh, but we'll keep improving it uh, some more and uh, as I just mentioned before we'll switch fully to uh, to AL uh, from CL to AL which will allow us uh, in again a 12 to 24 months time frame to fully retire seaside so seaside is going away in 12 to 24 months from now and finally uh, when we talk about uh, machine learning and we really believe this is the future uh, for this product we already have a few features out of the box as you know things like late payment prediction but we realize that in order to do you know really interesting scenarios scenarios that really add value and provide value to the customers you need you need some domain knowledge so we can provide there's only so much we can provide out of the box for the products but we need you to uh, take it to the last mile you know custom use use the the, the platform uh, that we will provide for you to actually implement these machine learning scenarios for your customers because a lot of them actually require um, that you know the scenarios that you know the domain knowledge so we are committed to help you with that and we we will uh, we will evolve our platform to provide you with the means to to do exactly that and to implement um, very powerful and great machine learning scenarios in business central um, now you either talked a little bit before about how you know how you can protect your customers from uh, from uh, you know getting these upgrades uh, during business hours and that kind of thing so I want to talk a little bit about the rhythm and how how the how the, the versions and the different improvements we are putting in the product are going to made be made available to you this fall we release a major we, we did a major release um, and with a you know in six months from now in spring we'll do another major release so that the cadence of major release is going to be six months we're going to release a major version of the product every six months so major means that um, that we might break you uh, a major release is by definition going to potentially be breaking you might have to refactor some of your code you might have to uh, change will might change some signature and some methods some events you know the usual thing um, and and there are definitely going to be some recompile uh, involved between these two uh, between these two moments we'll have every month we'll push a release to the cloud which is going to be a minor release so we uh, you know at the bottom line is supposed to illustrate our you know our main base code when we do you know hot fixes regularly regular features and also we'll pick some uh, some selected features you know we'll hand pick some minor features which are non breaking and we'll push them to the cloud as minor releases uh, every month and they will be synchronized with the release of cumulative updates um, as as you know them for for the on-prem world so we're synchronizing the cumulative updates and the um, um, the cloud the cloud minor versions right so this is the rhythm um, one major version every six months and one minor version every month so the minor version they're going to be they are going to be non-breaking uh, that means you know we'll 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 do all we can so you don't have to change anything in your solution to adopt a minor version um, so one last thing uh, I have a small announcement to make um, when you know when we when we work on development at Microsoft uh, if you're a developer you know that when you when you work on new features there's a feature that we are going to make uh, available publicly and put in the product uh, obviously but next to that there's a lot of other things that are going on in the development team so we do prototypes uh, small experiments we play with technology um, and we realize that all this work actually never makes it out of uh, a lot of this work actually never makes it out of the four walls of Microsoft and uh, we thought that maybe uh, maybe this could be interesting to you to the developer community so we've decided to share and uh, starting from today we uh, we are starting a, uh, a blog a blog series which we call the business central uh, technology blog 
where we are going to just put out there all these things we are doing. Um, we have a lot of ideas already lined up and uh, we have launched it today with a couple of posts. Uh, one is for me just announcing the series and uh, the first one is from, from Espen, um, who is the architect of the modern development. So check it out. There is one, one simple URL to, uh, to get to it, ak.ms slash bctech. That will take you to, uh, to the blog series directly. And um, any code sample related to the blog, we'll, we'll post them on GitHub in, in that repository. So you just, you know, do whatever you want with it. You know, take it, you know, put in your product. It's uh, free to use, open sourced. You know, we, uh, we really like to hear what you, uh, what you think about it. You know, so, you know, please comment. Uh, add your, you know, um, your opinions about what, what we write uh, and the code we publish. If there's anything you want to hear about, also you know, let us know on that blog and, uh, and on the blog, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have some fun with that. Um, so I hope you like it. Just check it out. And with that, uh, I only have left to uh, to say thank you. So that's that's the uh, the blog, right? Um, I only have to say thank you. Uh, thank you very much to be uh, such a great community. Uh, it's you know it's really great. I can't you know I can't describe how you know exciting it is to be part of this community and to to work on Business Central with you guys. I mean it's never been a better moment to be on Business Central. It's a product with a fantastic future, and you know you are really supporting it in a fantastic way. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of love around this product, and and we really appreciate that. Um, so you know I hope I hope you enjoy you enjoy this wine as much as I do. Thank you very much.